are in the process of finding our tribe in the last couple of months. It will continue for a few more months, but I am thanking God for the progress we are making. Um, I think we have like 10 tribes now, and each of the tribes began to connect with each other within the tribe, and they are having meetings, conferences. We had a family meet actually with the Martin. He is heading the family tribe. So they had a wonderful family, kingdom family meeting two weeks ago. Then we had a meeting with the kingdom healthcare tribe. They are trying to connect more. And now next Saturday, please don't miss it. That is our Kingdom Education Congress, World Congress. People are invited from all over the world. They are registering now. So hope you have seen the ad on the Ecclesia group or Facebook or somewhere. Please share it with other people. You have to register. Go to that website mentioned on that graphics and then you will receive the Zoom link for the meeting. So please don't miss out. And I encourage you to take initiative. Don't wait for me to do everything. I'm not a pastor of a church. I am a coach. <laughs> you know, I'm coaching you, training you, keeping you to find what God has put in you. And when you discover that, you have to run with it. You cannot wait for somebody else to do it for you. You have, to, you have to take the initiative. You have to take the steps, what the Holy Spirit is showing you, giving you. And I'm when so you good. do, then he will show up and help you with the rest. So I am so thankful to the Lord and encouraged by what he is doing through all these tribes already. And we are in the process of becoming a nation. Once we become all these tribes and find where we belong and begin to function in the calling based on the gifts never underestimate the power of the gifts god has given you because the bible says your gift will make room for you and bring you before great men and women so master your gift sing less songs and focus on mastering your gifts <laughs> don't look for another goosebump you know feeling something god is in you he's around you he's with you 24 7 he said he will never leave you nor forsake you he's in you he's with you you live in the holy of holies 24 7 whether you feel it or not you are with him he's with you you are in christ christ is in you inseparable for all eternity so don't wait for that emotional you have to mature on that emotion and learn to walk with him based on truth and revelation, not based on your feelings. Somebody say amen. And many people never get amen. to that season. Believe me, listen to me, saints of God. Most believers never get over the season of feeling. They never learn to walk in the truth and in the revelation because they get stuck in that season of feeling. As long as you live in that realm of feeling, you will not make progress in your walk with God. You have to move. I was there. I was there like 15 years. I have to hear something to feel something. Know that God is there. I passed that stage. I realize I am in the Holy of Holies with my father in the garden 24 seven inseparable. He's with me, he's in me and I can activate his presence, his glory, his gift anytime, anywhere on the mountaintop or in the valley, anywhere in the world, any city, any country, any part of the world, God is same. Because in Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, I could preach and go on, but it's not my turn today. We have a wonderful guest with us today to bring a powerful word from the Lord. I am so excited. I've been looking forward to this all week because he is my brother. We are brothers from the same mother, <laughs> believe it or not. Now, usually we say we are from the brothers from the from another mother. But in this case, with our guest speaker today, we are brothers from the same mother. So I will introduce him in a minute. But before I introduce, I want to ask one more time, anybody has anything else, any word, any 
thing that you want to share before we move on. Hi, Sally, good to see you. Thank you, Abraham. Good you, to be here. You look full of energy and healed and whole. <laughs> Jesus' name. Thank you. Is Teddy here? I don't see Teddy here today. Oh, um, he here. I did speak to her yesterday. Okay. Hi, Ashton. Hi, Theory. Hi, Amit. Michael. Tony, Finahas, Santi, Charbert, Sabrina, Bishops, Daniela. Welcome, welcome everyone. Paula, welcome Minty, welcome. Uh, then who else? Everybody else. Kerry Ann Chambers. I saw somebody's hand. Who was that? Fred, what's happening? Yes. Ready? Yes, Apostle. Please. Um, I want to appreciate God that um, uh, the Kingdom Academy is on the way here in uh, Choma. Uh, thank you so much for your support and uh, your, your help and everything. And uh, we are just uh, almost there. We have done, I think, about two or three classes. And, uh, very soon, we are starting, I think, by the we want us to thank God for what is doing. So I thought, oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. God bless. Somebody else was speaking at the same time. So, Freddie, what is happening with the I think you already shared that. Did, did I see somebody else's hand? Okay, let's pray. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to help us today with what he has in store for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us all back safe and sound after another week. Father, I thank you for your presence and your glory. I thank you for your anointing. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your peace around us, in us, Father. We bless you. We give you all the glory and praise because you are with us all the time. Emmanuel, God with us. I thank you for my Ecclesia family from all across the globe. I thank you, Lord, for the word that you have for us today. Thank you for anointing your servant, my brother, Dr. John. I bless him. I thank you for being with his mouth today to bring a word for the season that we are in. I bless each one of us, Father. I thank you for my kingdom family. I speak healing. I speak peace. I speak grace over them. I thank you for your protection and your favor. I thank you for your glory to fall upon us today as we hear thy word and, to, and listen to you, my God. I thank you for healing. We pray for Teddy. I thank you for Finehas or anybody else who's not feeling well in their physical body. We declare healing. In Jesus Christ's holy name, we bless you, Father. We thank you for what you're doing through this ecclesia. Lord Jesus, we invite you. You said you will build your ecclesia and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I thank you, Lord Jesus, coming and building your ecclesia in and through us the way you want it according to your design and your blueprint, Father. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for speaking to us. We bless you. We give you all the glory and praise. Thank you for all that you're doing across the world in different countries, in Philippines, in Zambia, Nigeria, in Denmark, in South Africa, in India, and, and many other countries, Father. We thank you for what you're doing. We bless you because you are a good God. In Jesus Christ's holy name, we pray. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. Thank you, everyone. Welcome back to the Ecclesia. We are so excited to have my good brother, Dr. John Heder Petit Frere. It's a French name. He's my brother from the same mother. We met a couple of years ago uh, on a Zoom meeting, actually, like this, um, with another group, and God connected us. Then he's originally from Haiti and living in Florida and traveling back and forth. He has one of the largest ministries in the country of Haiti and a 
big church there, around 3,000 people. I went there. I was there with him uh, a few months ago last year. We went there to minister with another friend of ours. It was a powerful time. So I felt like I need to invite him to come and share with the Ecclesia. So as we are having a guest speaker on the first day, first week of every month. So for March, he is our guest speaker. He's not a guest. He's a part of the family. And uh, I've been in touch with him in different ventures in the kingdom. And God is taking us deeper and wider for his glory and for his purpose. So Dr. Jean, so blessed and privileged to have you with us. I know this is going to be a powerful time and I can't wait to hear what God has put in you. You are free to share whatever the Holy Spirit puts in your heart, flow like a river and, and blaze like a fire <laughs> and release whatever the Holy Spirit has put in you. So my Cliche family, let's welcome my brother, Dr. Jean. Mike is yours. Well, praise God. Um, it is such a joy and a privilege to, to be um, with you, um, Apostle. And, uh, and indeed, um, for those of you who probably don't know or might question him, how could we be brother from the same mother? And, <laughs> <laughs> you so, can explain that. You know, so maybe you might, maybe you make you, you maybe you are familiar with that phrase. Look can be deceiving, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but our mother is not here today. I don't know where she is, so I don't know yeah. what happened. Maybe you'll show up later. Yeah, um, but we, but we are, what we are, you know. Um, I was trying to explain to someone the other day um, the whole process of. Um, when you have the sense that you've met someone, you just met them and you feel like you knew them, you know, for, 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 for forever. And, um, and I was asked to, to see if I could make sense of that. And I showed them something, um, show, but I'm gonna attempt to show it to you now uh, before I move into our time of sharing today. I don't know if you guys can see this. Um, I have somewhat, it's almost like it's a cross I have in the center, okay? And I have different layers, you know, um, in the out circle. Now, let's say you're here, everybody's here. If I, if I thought of it, I would have made a slide for it. It just, just came to me right now. So I'm just trying to make sense of it, okay? Um, And so, okay. All right, so here is what I could think of as quick as I, so when you see this, you see this circle, this is God in the center. And some, you know, when you have to leave your, the known or what you used to or your culture for that matter, or, you know, and you want to pursue, you know, God, Sometimes this is the outward. This is what you used to be in. So you have to leave those people and then to make that move towards God. But you see, what happened is, so I leave my out circle and come to this place with God in pursuit of God, which is here. But at the same time, my brother Abraham from India is pursuing God. So he make from his whatever is here, move into this. I made it from Haiti here. So I'm here, he's there. God being the center that drawing us closer as we're pursuing him. Let's say I make one more move as I, as I grow into my knowledge of God, you know, and my relationship with him grow, grow closer. I get closer here. He got closer there. Guess what? We were here. I was here, I was here, he was there. You see how far we were from each other? As I drew closer to God, he's drawing closer to God. Guess what? We are getting closer to each other. God being the center of the thing. So that's my kind of simple explanation as to sometimes you meet people, you feel like you've met them before. Yes, you have before the throne in your fellowship, in your intimacy with God. You get to meet people 
And so that when you meet them in, in person, you feel like you've known them before. It is true, you've known them before because you've met them before throne, before God. So anyways, I want to just say thank you, uh, Apostle Abraham, for um, inviting me to share today. Uh, I'm so humbled by it. I consider it as an awesome privilege. And I want to also say to everyone that, you know, um, you have truly a gift from God and his person is a remarkable, remarkable person. I have experienced him in many ways. And I've understand that his heart is pure. He has a heart of gold, you know, really a heart of, of for God and for his people. And <laughs> kingdom, he live in the you can't have a conversation, you know, for a minute without the kingdom being coming out in some form or shape. So it's something that he read. So I'm really, I'm really honored to have you as part of my family, brother. And I and I know, I know God will take us to places. And I look. Forward. Uh, uh, so now I want to share with you today, um, within my, the time allotted to me on the topic of understanding the power of kingdom colonization. Um, and um, I think I am qualified to speak on it for a number of reasons. Number one, I am from Haiti, a country who has been colonized by the French, by the English, by the Spanish, um, and, and, and for many years, for many years. And for those of you who are students of history, you would have heard that Haiti was called by the French back in the 17, early 1700s, was called the Pearl of the Island because Haiti used to provide France, um, which almost 60 or eight to 80% of goods in terms of coffee, spices, and cotton, and you name it. So it was a very flourishing nation. Um, and so the French days, we, a little history, you know, we had one of our leaders was Toussaint Louverture. Toussaint Louverture was a slave, but he was smart enough to play the French. So he made the French fight against the English, the Eng you know, um, kick the English out, after that, he goes to the Spanish and have the Spanish kick the, kick the French out. So he keep on, you know, rotating those superpowers, but they could never thought that a little black slave could have been doing that, that he actually was the one um, doing all of that. When the French found out that it was him, the French managed to set a trap and arrested him. And, uh, and that was like in 19, um, 1700, or late 1700, and that took him to France. And they put him high on a hill in a, in, a, in a fort and let him lay there naked. And he was killed by cold. They just let him lay there naked and kill him because the French did. The place where they put him was Fort du Jour. It was a fort high in up altitude. And that's where they put him and he got killed. But one thing he said, when they arrested him, he said this, he says, in arresting me, you are only cutting the top of the tree. The roots are deep and they are many and they will blossom. And, uh, and indeed, the roots were many. Not long after, another one emerged. It was Dessalines. And with him, we organized the fight you know, against the French and whatnot late 1700, and then in 1804, Haiti was declared to be the first black independent nation in the world. Now, that first black independent nation in the world was not at any regular price. It was at a very high price. It was a time where slavery was at its peak. You know, um, and to have a few blacks to, deter to determine that they're gonna be independent, was setting a bad example. So the world over has conspired to make Haiti pay because they say that's a bad example because slaves everywhere will revolt. And so 
So a lot of things happen as a result. To this day, as I'm speaking to you, there are things that are still being carried out that were planned back then, that are still being carried out in relation to Haiti. So I'm saying this little history. And so you have a nation, you know, Af I mean, Haitian came from Africa, of course you would know, from slavery into what we know as a dictatorship. You know, you probably would have heard um, in the news, baby dog, papa dog, that's what the Duvalier. They rule over our nation for about 32 years. And in, 18, in 1986 came to turn and uh, Duvalier left, the Duvalier the son left and went to France. And ever since, so we come from slavery into dictatorship and then Uncle Sam and everybody else decided that we should be experiencing now democracy. So with no explanation of what it is, how it is to, to operate, how to deal with it. So we are now finding ourselves into a democracy, which is literally a demon that is really killing the nation. Um, not democracy itself that is doing that, but the, the lack of preparation there are. And so, so, so you had from slavery into dictatorship and now into democracy, so-called democracy. So, and Haiti now is going through so much turmoil. You probably would have heard in the news how much it is becoming really unsafe and so on and so forth politically and everything else. So today I'm saying all of this to say that um, I know things or two when it's come to um, colonization. We have seen it from the Spanish who started it. We have seen it from the English. We have seen it from the French. We even have seen it from our friend from the West, the US. Because after Haiti was being, you know, and as Haiti got in the, its independence, although the US did not recognize us as a nation until after 60 years, 60 years after we get our independence, the US finally accepted us. But we went with them to fight in Savannah, late 70s, you know, and um, in, eight, in 19, um, 1914, the US came and uh, occupied Haiti. And the first act they did was to walk into our central bank and took all our gold. I mean, we've seen it. And then to the point where we have had leaders who have seen how corruption has worked and served certain, too much so that they have been trained to be corrupt. So they are actually very corrupt in Haiti. However, it, they didn't just invent it. They've seen it at work from the various powers that have been colonizing us. To this day, a nation who has been so-called independent from 1804, that nation is yet to be liberated. And I stand here to say the kingdom is the, on the, is the only alternative to the freedom that nations around the world, but Haiti more importantly, is craving for. There's a verse that says, he that the son set free is free indeed. There is a level of thing that would call you are free indeed. So that's what I want to share with you today. You know, understanding, um, understanding the power of colonization. If I were to define um, the word, I don't need, you don't need to go far because I am conscious of time. Um, if I were to define it for you, you know, we use the word colonization and we've seen, I could just give you a text in a lexical definition of colonization, but suffice for me to say, Colonization is an act of a power, of a superpower thereof to induce or to submit, subdue another group of people, you know, um, because we, when you say colonization, you have the colony and you have the metropole. The metropole would have been the country from which those people are originated and going into another land or a foreign land, you know, to 
colonize them or to control them or to, well, you see, not necessarily colonize them. In some ways, colonization means exploitation. So that's what, when you hear the word colonization, other definition for colonization, let me give you one. It says occupation, exploitation, putting trust to ship, underdeveloped or underpopulated territory by national of the metropolis. But I mean by national of the metropolis, the metropole would have been, let's say England, for example. England would have considered the metropole. And wherever England would send its emissaries to occupy the proper, uh, 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 territory, that territory would be called a colony. Now, the emissaries that they send would be the colonizers to induce in their role. I'm gonna define it just a little bit, okay? But we have a saying in, uh, in French that says, that's a, that's that's the philosophy of colonization. It says in French, "Tout pour tout par et pour la métropole." I mean, all by and for the metropolis. In other words, when the French send their emissaries to colonize, you know, the 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 the, 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 the West End, the West Indies, it was meant that whatever riches that those places have, would have eventually have to be sent to the metropole. So those big nations actually exploit, be it Africa or the Caribbean or wherever else, because you see, when Christoph Columbus went, you know, uh, you, know you, you guys know the story, he came to Haiti. They had three boats, three, three big boats, La Penta, La Nina, La Santa Maria. And it is believed that Santa Maria sank in Haiti. And uh, people, you know, like some Israeli have identified where the, where the ship is actually under. Um, it was, you know why it sunk? It sunk because it was overloaded with gold. Metro, that's why it sunk, because the Spanish were very greedy. That's why they killed all the Indians, because they overworked them. I don't want to get into make it this uh, history lesson because that's not what I'm here. I just want to say in, in context to show you what's happening. So the metropolis would send people to colonize other island at the expense, you know, it's colonizing them, but it's really, really to exploit whatever they are. They never colonize anywhere that has nothing. So in Haiti, they had a lot of gold, they had a lot of precious metal, and that's basically why and we are a very fertile ground. So a lot of things were happening. So now that's what people use colonization or the world use colonization for, to exploit, to occupy, to putting into some kind of servitude others. So basically you see colonization as a bad thing. So whenever you say colonization, it tends to raise you know, people's eyebrows. You know, what colonization? And we see people who big countries that you know that are now big. You know what? They are big because they have exploited, you know, smaller nations. So colonization left a bad taste in our mouth, be it from Africa or or the islands. You know, as to as a bad thing. I am not here to make an apology for colonization, but what I'm trying to say is. I'm just trying to bring the word into focus. Colonization was not the world's idea. It was God's idea. God started this thing. God is the one that started it. As always, when the enemy gets something, Satan can think he corrupted. it. Because back in the days, nations, be it you know, the superpower there was, they were in a race to get more property, more territory under their lordship. And that's all kingdoms is all about. Kingdoms, you know, because as you would have known already, a kingdom is a ter you know, you cannot talk about the kingdom without ter talking about the territory. You cannot talk about kingdom without having a, a, a king. Um, so, so if you have a king, he must have territory. 
And how do I determine where my kingdom reach? Wherever my laws or my words have worth or become authority, that's the extent of my kingdom. So wherever, so that's what I say. You say, when you go to England, people drive on the, on the left. That's what the law says. When you, drive, when you come to America, people drive on the right. Well, it's still driving, but what I'm saying is that law different in different places. So wherever you apply certain law means that's the extent of the authority of that kingdom. So all the kingdom there were, were after getting more territories under their jurisdiction. The more territories, the greater your kingdom. So all kingdom wants to extend the rulership to other territories. That's all. Every kingdom is after the same thing. That's why we're not we're fighting over land. Currently, we're going through a big, you know, something in Ukraine. You all know what it's all about. Extend our reach, extend our territory, extend our influence. All kingdom is after the same thing. But guess what? Guess where it all started? God started it. Not with that intent. God says, you know what? Let us make men and let him have dominion. But you know what? Psalm 115 verse 16 says, the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. So what God did, he created something called earth. And he placed men on this earth with the intent that this man would be in sync or in relationship with him will be his extent. In other words, man would rule earth as God rule heaven. The difference between the colonization from a God point of view is this. Colonization as we know it is all by and for the metropole. In other words, the metropole or the big country will exploit any little country, we take whatever resources that they have to make themselves richer. The difference between God's kind of colonization is God says, you know, um, I want earth to be an extension of what heaven is. By this, what do you mean by that? I want earth to be an extension, okay? By as what heaven is. What is actually referring to? God is saying, in effect, I am gonna create that thing called earth. I'm gonna put man on it and man would be in relationship with me that that he has my heart. So through him, I will rule earth. God is invisible, but he has a visible species called man. So you see, any place. So it's almost as if like, I don't want to lose you, but I'm going to say this this way. It's as if like God is saying, God the invisible will rule the visible through his, the invisible inside the visible on the visible. I know I've lost you. <laughs> but in effect, what I'm trying to say is that God who is invisible want to rule earth, which is visible, through the invisible, his spirit in man, which is visible. So God wants to rule the earth through man and who's and you know and whom God is. God is, is in man, and God will rule earth through. His spirit, man. So in other words, God never intended for men to run things by themselves. God expected men to be in a relationship with him. And through that relationship, men would receive God's heart as to how to manage, govern, dominate on earth. And what God says, as we know, he says, you know, as my will is done in heaven, I want it to be done on earth. That's what God wants. God want, the difference between God's type of colonization versus the world colonization, God is all for the colony, not for the metropole. Heaven doesn't need nothing from earth. Earth, on the contrary, needs anything that heaven has. So God wants to make earth an extension of what heaven is. 
And if that to be carried out properly, that means there should be no sickness on earth. There shouldn't be no disease on earth. There shouldn't be no poverty on earth. Because if earth is to be a representation of what heaven is, if the intended, the people are working correctly with the Lord Jesus or God, that means they are supposed to manage earth as heaven is managed. So whatever we don't see in heaven is basically illegal for it to be on earth. God intended through his, that personal relationship between him and man, what, so we want to make earth an extension of heaven. In other words, we want to make earth a little heaven. Heaven, support, when you come on earth, you're supposed to be an extension of the territory that is heaven. So basically what I'm trying to say here in effect is that how does that, how, how do we do this? How do we bring this about? Causing earth to be an extension of heaven. How does one go about doing this? I'll tell you. God says, I'm gonna, Adam, I'm gonna work with you. I'm gonna equip you, give you all that it takes. You know, I'm gonna give you rulership, dominion, so that you can actually you know, as you see me do in heaven, you do on earth. We all knew that Adam created a great treason by giving the unemployed cherub the power over earth. So Adam lost that dominion. Now God had to come, you know, with another plan or a plan B, so to speak, to restore the authority or the dominion that was lost. It will all make sense at the end, so stay with me. So God wanted to do that, so God sent now Jesus. Why, did, why he had to send Jesus? Let me say this. As far as who owns the earth, it was never questioned. Because the Bible said the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So earth was never a question as to who owns earth. God owns earth. But he has given what we call a mandate or he has given, um, it's almost like a contract of management contract to men. You manage earth. He didn't even give them, okay? He managed the earth. And because men did a bad job in managing earth and also caused a good treason to cause the devil to come and take over, God had to come. And because every spirit is illegal on earth, God couldn't find nobody who was qualified to redeem what was lost. So he had to come himself. So Jesus came himself on earth, as we all know, you know, and um, he came with a sole purpose of restore what was damaged. Restore what was missing. Restore what men could not be, what men could not do for himself. So basically, what he says, God sent Jesus. Jesus came. He came with a sole purpose to restore what was missing. Restore men into his stewardship. Restore men into his dominionship, if I may put it this way. So that's what he came. So one day, Jesus, you know, was speaking to the disciples. He says, what do men say I am? Who do men say that I am? And all oh, men, they start talking. They say, you are Moses. They say, you are Elijah. They say, you are this. But that's not really what Jesus was all about. Jesus was more interested in finding out what do they think he was? Who do they think they was? Who do you say that I am? And Peter responds. Peter says, Thou art Christ, son of the living God. You are Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said in verse, and that is Matthew 16. And I'm reading verse um, 17. Jesus answered him and said, Blessed are you, Simon, bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my father who is in heaven. 
flesh and blood has not revealed that, but my Father in heaven. I tell you, you are Peter, Petros, a small stone. And upon that rock, Petra, P E T R A, rock, a big, huge mongoose trap. It says, You are Petros, a small stone. But upon the revelation that you just received of who I am, I will build my ecclesia. Now, here's now. I will build my ecclesia. And Jesus went on to say, all right? Jesus went on to say, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And he continued to say, the gates of hell will not prevail. And then he continues to say, verse 19, he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, there is, this is loaded. Truly loaded with stuff. And I will attempt here now to go into a few things and share something with you. He says, I will give you the keys. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Now we understand many times that people trusted this verse, verse, um, verse, um, uh, I'll build my church, verse 17. That most of the time trusted it, I, I'll build my church and the gate of hell will not prevail against it. But when we think of church, what do we say? We need to put it in context so that we know the, what, whether or not what is said at the bottom or for the, 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 the verse 19, verse 18, verse 19, is it in line with what church do? Because when we think of church, what do we think really? We think of buildings. We think of a pastor. We think of a choir. We think of praise and worship, dancing, and we think of offering. We think of those kind of things. When we say church, because the brain, our mind doesn't think of words. We think our brain thinks of images. Okay. When I say a word, the image come up. It's one only when the image come up you can understand what I'm saying. So when we when we hear the word church, what do we think? We think of pews, a building, and we all know what we do. And so, and because religion had us, have us believe it that way, you know? Um, and then we have people come and do all kinds of things. So, well, we have to implement, we have to improvise, you know, because, it, you know, we are after the sensational. Because, because people are more concerned about their senses, feeling good, how I feel, goosebumps. So we are really into, so we are very, it's almost as if you want to say that we are too sensual, so to speak, because we are run by our senses. So that's what we think in terms of church. But when you look, when you look at the following verses, okay, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatsoever loose on, and on earth is loose in heaven. I'm hearing, I'm saying, does church do those things? I mean, besides we say, we bind, we bind, we bind this, we bind that, we bind that, we bind the other. I mean, okay, do you see church actually binding what is happening or getting involved in society and changing the course of, of their death? Do you see church doing those kind of things? Do you see church involved and actually bring sense to society. Do you see the church involved in, in the affairs of men? Do you see church speak of world events? We are the only entity who are here, who have jurisdiction on the seen and the unseen. I put it this way, and I wish for you to Remember this, every physical reality has a spiritual dimension. 
two phrases I want you to remember. Every physical reality has a spiritual dimension. And every spiritual reality has a physical expression. I'll repeat it again. Every physical reality has a spiritual dimension and every spiritual reality has a physical expression. In other words, I'm just trying to say in short, everything is spiritual by nature. Everything is spiritual by nature. Hebrews tells us what we see come from what we don't see. We are the only entity that are both, that have our foot, one foot in the physical, one foot in the spiritual, who can cause change in both realms. He says, whatever we bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever we bound in, or what we loose on earth is loose in heaven. So we are the only entity who can actually affect change in both domains. Now, if every, I hope you guys remember this. I said every physical reality has a spiritual dimension. Every spiritual reality has a physical expression. In other words, there are some things that we are seeing that are happening in our world today. There are print black expression of a spiritual reality. When we look at what is happening in certain parts of the world, we should ask ourselves, what has happened in the spiritual realm that caused such reaction? Because everything is spiritual in nature. I think it's time to call for a redefinition and a realignment so that God can bring us into what we call a restoration. We cannot go as business as usual. We have to redefine our purpose, our call, understand what we're all about, align ourselves with this strategy so that we can indeed fulfill our mission. I will say this. When Jesus said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom, so whatsoever thing you bound on earth, but when, no, 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 actually before that, he says, I will build my ecclesia and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, here is my understanding of it. Jesus said, I will build my ecclesia and the gates of hell. Now, when it speaks of gate, when the Bible speaks of gate, we need to understand something. Gates, when he says gates, he's not referring to what we normally think. Gates, small gates, big gates, iron gates, wooden gates, whatever gates. Actually, he's not saying that because I am trying to convey to you that everything is spiritual by nature. And if that be the case, I wish I could establish that foundation a different way, but I have, I'll do what I have to do. So when, it's, when the Bible speaks of gates, it's actually referring to a physical gate. When it says, when it speaks of gates, it's actually, it's actually speaking of a, a place. Like in the Bible, we've seen gates. Okay? If you look at Proverbs, um, Proverbs chapter, uh, let's say Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs 31. Verse 23, here's verse 23. It says, her husband is known at the gate when he sits among the elders of the land. All right? And 2 Samuel chapter 19, verse 8, we saw, so in, in, in Proverbs 22, Proverbs 22, verse 23, we've seen Gates are seats 
or places where decisions are made. That's where the judges sit to administer judgment. That's where decisions are made. So actually, God is saying, I will build my ecclesia. All right? And the gates, the power that be, those in parliament, those in authority, okay, will not prevail against it. Hell will not be able to have too many people in those positions without me having enough people in that position to balance things. So the gates, will, the gates of hell will not prevail. The gates of hell will not prevail only because when the church or when the ecclesia understand its role and plays it accordingly. If it is not otherwise, the gates of hell would have prevailed. As we know it now, it's prevailing to a large degree. It's prevailing to a large degree because in most cases, we were too church-minded, we were too heavenly-minded, we become no earthly good. So we are not involved in the affairs of our societies and our communities, so we are not impacting as we should. And that is why I am so grateful and grateful to the Lord for, for Apostle Abraham and his endeavors and teaching people about the kingdom. And he has gone, you know, um, he has gone, he just, you know, just, I mean, he has gone full fern about, you know, he's passionate, obsessed literally about this. So we say, so we saw get as a seat where judgment are made. It's places, it's almost like a tribunal. That's where decisions are made. So he says the gates of hell will not prevail. And I'm gonna show you how the gates of hell not to prevail against it. How do we go about causing the gates of hell not to prevail? Not being so, as somebody wrote, heavenly minded. You know, we sing song like the heaven is not, you know, the earth is not my home, I'm only passing through. So we're not involved, we're not really involved, we're not impacting. So um, let, let me su suffice it to say, if gates are places of authority, by whom should they be occupied? Because what is legal is not necessarily moral. All it takes, all it takes, you cause the, you, by, by our inaction, if we cause the wrong people to get into power, they will make decisions that are ungodly become law. And you will become the outcast by not obeying those. So we cannot be sitting, waiting for the sweet by and by. We need to be busy getting ourselves involved. The salt needs to mingle with the meat in order to cause decay not to happen. So what I'm saying, the Jesus says, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, allow me, brothers and sisters, to share with you this. Now, in the verse 18, it says, and I tell you, okay, verse 19, it says, I will give you the keys, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So whatsoever thing you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever thing you lose on earth is loose in heaven. Now, Jesus used the word ecclesia when he was speaking. Let me tell you this. This, this word ecclesia, actually, we have to understand what in what context it was used. We all know that Greece was previously the superpower. They are the one who are philosophers. And we all know those big names, okay? that we are studying in our universities now, you know, we are in our big universities and uh, we study them. Socrates, you know, um, so Aristotle, you know, we, we, we study those. Most of those guys are Greek. Now guess what? Greek, when you say Ecclesia, from their mindset, from the time that Jesus said that, it was met a group of people set apart by the population to govern. It's almost as if like Jesus was saying, I mean, what 
understood from what Jesus says. This was a parliament. Today we call them parliament. We call them congressmen. People that we elect into an office, we endow them with power to govern, make decisions as to the future of our cities, our nations. So from a Greek mindset, the word ecclesia means a selected group of people elected by the people put in position to govern. So if I were to go by that definition, when Jesus says, I will be my ecclesia, he was actually saying, I will have myself a group of people that will make laws, that will make decisions, make proclamation, declaration, and that will run things. Not just sing some, you know, um, 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 you know, like, you know, kumbaya, you know, I'm just saying, I will have myself a group of people that will legislate, make laws, you know, make laws and principles and whatnot that will run things. Now, we understand that Greece was not always in power. After the Greek came the Romans. The Romans were what to call the superpower. Romans had the military might. When Greece got disintegrated, Romans came into power. Now, Romans now, they had the military might. But the Romans were trained by the Greek. The Romans were trained by the Greek. The, the great philosophers were Greek. So there were Romans, and uh, 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 there were Romans, but at the same time, Greek in their thinking. So let's see what the Romans understood by that word ecclesia. From a Roman's point of view, the Romans saw ecclesia. What they call ecclesia? What's the Romans call ecclesia? The Romans call ecclesia a group of people sent to a foreign land with a very specific mission to educate those people into the mannerism, the philosophy, and the culture of the motherland. That's what the Romans understood. A group of emissaries sent to another place with the mission to educate those people into their culture, their language, their mannerism, their way of living. That's another way of control. That's another way of extending that Roman empire into another place. Because let's say Rome were to come to Africa. Well, the mission would have been to train the African to dress like a Roman, talk like a Roman, eat like a Roman, behave like a Roman, and thus make Africa an extension of Rome. That being understood, Jesus says, I will build my ecclesia. I will have my group of people, my set ones, and they are to go into, guess what? What do you think? Jesus, man, he says, go ye into all the world. What? To have mission? Uh, give arms? What do you mean? Going to all the world? Going to all the world? Yes, because all kingdom is after the very same thing. Extend their territories. So we are to go into all the world as what? To do what? We are to go into all the world as emissaries of the kingdom of God to instruct of the culture of the kingdom. You see, the culture of the kingdom transcends all culture. The philosophy of the kingdom, because we all behave according to our philosophy. So we need to revisit our philosophy of life and of the kingdom. I wish I had time to talk about the philosophy. The philosophy of the kingdom is what we need because we behave according to our philosophy. We understand according to our philosophy. I do the way I do things, the way I do them, because that's how I understand them. Everything we do in life, we do it according to our philosophy. So we need to 
So when we question, it's not what we do, we need to question. We need to question our mindset, what causes us to do the thing we do. Two. So philosophy is something that is worth looking into. Because once we understand that, we understand the philosophy. So we are, Jesus is saying, I will build my ecclesia, I will have my emissaries sent into various parts of the world with the sole mission to educate, to train, to, 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 to train them with the culture, the philosophy, the mannerism, the way of living. And therefore he went on to tell you what this kingdom is all about, what it is, and how it differs from the others. So when we go into various parts of the world, I am basically an emissary. That's what Paul says. Paul says in Rome and Second Corinthians chapter five, verse twenty. Paul says in Second Corinthians chapter five, verse twenty, um, and I read it for you right now, quickly. It says, Paul says, um, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. What does that mean? We are ambassadors for Christ. What is the role of an ambassador? Did you know that an ambassador is not entitled to its own opinion when he's on a mission for the, for the kingdom? Do you know that an ambassador has no right to speak his own mind in any way that it differs from the philosophy of the kingdom he represents? Do you know any ambassador that, that dare to give an opinion that differs from the kingdom that he represents is recalled? Paul says we are ambassadors. In other words, my view, my worldview is supposed to be according to what the kingdom's worldview is. You know, I have seen ambassadors who are in trouble. I have I've known a couple of them, friends of mine, who are in trouble because they are seeing their country doing things that they don't agree with. But as an ambassador, they cannot say. I met with one in private one time. He was telling me how he feel really strange because he doesn't agree with the kind of thing, the way his government is treating certain people. But as an ambassador officially, he has no right, he cannot speak it. An ambassador is a representative of his majesty or the kingdom he represents. Paul says, we are ambassadors. I think we need to be trained and equipped so that we know, you know, we need to have a, 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 a procedure, a manual, um, I'm gonna, what I call uh, what I would call an, ambas an, um, an ambassadorial manual, where we have to train people. What is an ambassador? What's the role? What's the mission? How do they behave? How do they carry themselves? I think the very same thing as people go to diplomatic, you know, to school to study diplomacy, to know what's the role of an ambassador and whatnot. I think in the kingdom we ought to have that, too, so that people will really understand what this word actually mean what it stands for. As an ambassador, I remember one time, I hope I am not ex overextending my time. Please, you could tell me how much I have left. Um, I remember one time in my life, I had a situation. They had kidnapped my son. Um, and, uh, and, and at the time when my son was kidnapped, the kidnappers were asking $1 million. $1 million for, me, for the release of my son. And at the time where my son was kidnapped and they asked for a million dollar, it was a time where even if you pay the ransom, they still kill the victim. And you know what happened? I don't have time to give you guys a testimony. Maybe one day the Lord will make it possible. But I tell you this much. I tell you this much. I was at the point where I was teaching about the kingdom. That was in uh, 20, 22 years ago. 
that's when that happened, okay? So we've been in this kingdom for a long time. So at the time I was teaching, introducing some notion about the kingdom, and I was teaching exactly about being an ambassador. I was teaching the people through it. You know, I told them, well, you know what? I gave up my card for Christian. I'm no longer a Christian because I don't see where in the Bible where God called me a Christian. All right. And first John, the Bible called me, first John 3, it called me, we are sons. As son, I represent my father. And Ephesians 2, verse 19, the scripture says, we are citizens. As citizens, I represent the kingdom. As and, and, and of course, in 2 Corinthians 5, 10, verse 20, Paul said, we are ambassadors. As an ambassador, I represent the government of God. So as son, I represent the father, my father. As citizen, I represent the, king, the country, heaven. And as what? Ambassador, I represent the government of God. I was teaching the people just there, you know, what does it mean to be an ambassador? And that's when my son was kidnapped. And I said, when you're an ambassador, you're on a mission, who pays for the food you eat while you're on mission? The people say, well, the people, the country who sent you. I said, the car you drive, who pays for it? The country that sent you. As a matter of fact, ambassadors tend to live a bigger and a more lustrous life when they're on mission, because when they're on mission, no expense comes from them. You know, the US ambassador, when he goes to foreign country, he lives much better than here because he, he really lives off his salary. But there he lives off, you know, all is, is the, the state for everything. So actually, they have it better when they live outside. So I say, who the car he drives, the clothes he wears, the, um, the food he eats, who pays all of that? They all say the kingdom. And what are we? Ambassadors. And we, <laughs> and we struggle to eat. And we are, are we on mission or are we being recalled? What are we? Ambassador, when are we going to take this thing very seriously? When are we going to accept the fact that we are indeed in a kingdom and we are ambassadors? Now, and, 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 and if we see that our lifestyle is substandard toward what we believe the kingdom is, we need to call into correction. We need to correct some stuff. Well, to make a long story short, because I don't have time to either share the story or anything like that, because I believe my time should go to be come to an end. I'll tell you this much. I went in prayer. I told my wife, I said, honey, I don't want you to tell me what you think. I don't want to hear anything what you think, unless it's a verse. Keep your emotion to yourself. I will keep mine to myself. If it's a verse, you can share it with me. But anything else, keep it to yourself. You know why? Because I was, you know, going through this thing. I didn't want to speak. I don't want to give the enemy any, you know, I didn't know. I didn't want the enemy to know where I stood. I was declaring the word of God, although deep down there was some amount of fear. What if? The what ifs. So I stood. And I remember the last prayer I made, I called my wife. And there's a lot that goes in between that. I says, Father, as a representative of you, as an ambassador of your kingdom, I remember, I remember in what situation. If you understand the situation, you'll understand why I say what I said. I said, I demand, based on my covenantal right, as an ambassador who has been serious and committed to your cause, I demand as part of my right. This is not a favor. I'm not asking a favor because we see when you understand kingdom, when you understand kingdom, you un this is not church. You don't go to God and say, oh, God, please. And if, even though you don't deserve it, but because you say, please, he may give it to you. <laughs> this is not church. This is kingdom. Kingdom means, you know what kingdom means in a simple term? Okay, kingdom means there's a constitution that says what is your responsibility and what will be your privilege if you obey to what the privilege is. So there are privileges and there are responsibilities. So you pay, like if you are in America, you pay tax. So that when you have trouble, you can call 911. 
I just that, I, that's a very blatant, um, it's a very, very simplistic way to say it. But I'm, you understand the point. You understand what I'm trying to get. So I said, I demand. Because there was a time where I was kind of like tabulating, you know, finding what number they were calling from various numbers, you know, and I feel, I, f I almost feel like I'm giving you a disservice by telling you this piece without telling you the story. But maybe one time I'll do it. I'll do that. I asked that the guy, because they were calling me for a number and God gave me favor. I called the police chief. Now hear me, the police chief. I called him and I told him on Monday morning if he could identify two numbers for me. The man didn't know me. The favor of God caused him to tell me yes. Okay, and our, he told me he, he know where the numbers are. I tell him, I want you to send some policemen and civilian clothes and those numbers. And about two hours, he called me. I say, he says, I have men in position. What do you have in mind, Reverend? I tell him, I will tell you in the right time. You know why I couldn't tell him? Because I didn't know what I was doing. But I was acting on this on the word. I was saying, and then I now, now that I know, I have two numbers among the number you were calling me. Now that I know I have policemen where those numbers are, now I'm saying, I say, based on my covenantal right as an ambassador who's been faithful to your cause, I demand that those men call me no more from any other number but one of those numbers. You know why? Because I had said to my son, because you know, they had called me, I said, well, I don't talk to you unless I hear my son. And I told my son, tomorrow, you will sleep in your own bed. So I had time, you know, I had a, you know, I had a pressure with time now. So I asked the Lord that they call me from those two numbers. Believe you me, in about one hour and 45 minutes, my phone rings and it was one of those numbers. To make a long story short, to make a long story short, I had my wife already on the other phone. To, I said, once I wave at you, Tell the commissioner the number. And, you know, and then that's, that's how the whole story ends. I didn't pay a dime. And every single one of them got killed. When it says, whatever you buy on earth is bound in heaven, I know that. There is more to learn, and I'm learning every day. But what I'm saying is that this thing is no joke. This is not just a sample, you know, fly... To make people you know, feel good stuff. What is it? Whatever you buy on earth, I spoke into being and I said every single one of those involved in those kidnapping, all of them dead. All of them. That's one. That one is left. That even one. We as a church, the body of Christ, so to speak, have the jurisdiction. Let me show you this. How do we, how does senators? Um, how does those we elect into position of authority as the uh, ecclesia of the world? Okay, as the ecclesia of the world, those senators, uh, congressmen, and those, because these are the ecclesias. They are the, they are the one making laws and govern and whatever. How do we? How do they rule? They make resolution. As we make petition. They make resolution based on what they debate among themselves in the Senate. That's how they do it. So basically, what I'm trying to say here is this. How do we, as the ecclesia of God, you know, govern? We see what's happening. We make declaration. I wish I could expand more on the process of that, but that will come another time. We accomplish this through declaration and decrees, not through petitions. We cannot be always going to God and petition him. That's not, when you are in need, it's okay to make a petition when you are in need. But when it's come to you facing the enemy and facing the evil in our society that we are called to change, you cannot make petition. Decree. You make a declaration, you proclaim proclamation. For example, let me give you an example of what I'm trying to say here. Um, you remember, I don't have time to go in the verse, but, um, but you know, um, 
do you recall, do you recall that Moses was an Adelina coming from Egypt? They were going to, they were going to, um, they were going to Canaan. Do you remember that after a while, um, um, that, that the people, um, the people of the Egyptian came after the, 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 the Israelite. So behind was, behind was the Egyptian, in front of them was the Red Sea. No way out. So what is it now? Okay, um, now what happened? Moses says something. Um, Moses says something to the children of Israel that is very, that's astonished. Now I'm gonna tell you, um, I'm gonna tell you something that Moses said. Moses says, be quiet. Exodus chapter 14, verse 13. Moses says, chill out everyone. The Egyptian that you see today, you will, as of today, you will not see them no more. My question is, who told Moses to say that? Please don't say God because you cannot prove it. God didn't tell him to say that. Verse 13, if you look if, if in your Bible, it says, Moses said, this thing that you see now, fear not. Stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord. Which will refer to today for the Egyptian whom you see today, you shall never see again. What does he have the right to say that? Well, verse, verse, um, and Moses furthermore said, The Lord will fight for you. Only be silent. Dr. Now John, the, you have five minutes. All right, thank you. Please. Okay. So, so you see, there is a verse here that you're not seeing. Between verse 14 and verse 15, there's something happened. After Moses finished saying, you will not see them no more. I believe that Moses went to God and says, God, did you hear what I just said? Did you hear what I just said? And verse 15, here is God now. Why are you crying to me now? You say what I would have said. You are my ecclesia. You spoke into the situation what, I, what ought to be, and you're asking me now not to stand behind what you say? Speak to the children of Israel. Let them walk. And God gives the specific instruction, and what a miracle that he worked out in their lives that day. Brothers and sisters, this is serious stuff. Mm -hmm. I believe God is calling us to a place where, you know, the Bible say that, the creation, travail, they, 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 they long for the manifestation of the ecclesia of God. People to fulfill their, 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 their right position. We cannot trust. We cannot trust our world, this world as we know it. As we know it, to do it. They are not the ones who have been mandated by God to do it. We are called to be the salt of the earth. We are called to be the light of the world. Let's not, let's stop fighting with darkness. Let's just let the light shine. We don't need to be fighting darkness. Just shine and you'll see what happened. So when it's called to ordinances, resolution, proclamation, these are part of the jurisdiction of the Ecclesia of God. I pray that the Ecclesia of God will rise up and hear the cries of the nations who are traveling, who are in trouble. I pray the Ecclesia of God will speak on the situation in Ukraine even right now. Speak into those situations and see the manifestation of the glory of God coming to this. I was praying recently, but I don't have the time to get into this. But I'm saying that I pray that the Ecclesia of God will rise up and start making declaration and proclamation, not out of the air, sensible times are with it, led by the Spirit of God, because God has no voice but mine. He has no hands but mine. He has no feet but mine, because he has me here. It would be illegal for God to come and do something without me. So God will not without us. We understand already that we cannot without him. I bless you today. 
I pray that God would even through his spirit bring even greater revelation as we walk into it. And I pray that God through his spirit will catapult you into yeah. positive of influence whereby what you say you can actually start affecting the destinies of your nations. I pray that you'll take this matter very seriously before you give your viewpoint about anything to consult the constitution to see what does the kingdom say about this? Because as a representative of the kingdom, I ought not to have anything or any viewpoint that differs from the kingdom that I represent. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and cause you to walk on the open heaven. Even Jesus. What I do is what I see the Father do. The Lord bless you. Thank you so very much. Amen. Wow. My Lord, my God, that was loaded. <laughs> Amen. We'll need to listen to that. As he was praying, you know, as I was praying with him, I saw like a field, a field which is so green, which is so like a new planting you are the planting of the lord each one of you something new is getting birthed in you in this season you are in the birthing canal god is birthing something in you more and more people like somebody told me today i think delta was attending some conference somewhere she said they are talking about the kingdom they are talking about the ecclesia this is the season the whole world will turn, have to turn to the message of the kingdom. As we heard today, the purpose and power of kingdom colonization. Why would God want to invade earth with his kingdom? Because he wants to manifest life in heaven as it is on earth. Nothing more, nothing less. As it is, the same culture in heaven, God wants to manifest now on the earth. We all have different cultures we grew up in. Dr. Jean grew up in Haiti. I grew up in India. Some of all of us grew up in different countries, different culture. Now we had to transition into the kingdom culture. Some of the races and people groups on the earth, what's destroying them is their culture. But they blame somebody else for their problem or blame some other outside forces for their problem, but they are self-destroying because of the cultural default settings and mindsets and practices and belief system is destroying themselves. We had to shift into the kingdom culture, kingdom economy. So that is the purpose of colonization. God wants to manifest heaven on earth. The life that we are waiting to go to heaven someday after death or when Jesus comes, he wants to manifest that now on the earth. That's where he sent us to the earth. Before we leave, this is the final statement. Before we leave this planet earth, we're supposed to make earth a little bit more like heaven. Did you hear what I just said? Before you leave this planet, make sure you make this earth little bit more like heaven. <laughs> I want to say that one more time. Before you get onto that basket, somebody put you in that basket and bury you. Make sure you left this planet Earth a little more, a little bit more like heaven that God sent you to manifest on the earth, the kingdom that is in you. So, Dr. Sean, thank you. I know you're loaded. There's much more in you. And I encourage you to watch this teaching again and, and, and think on some of those statements as he made, like everything in the spiritual or has a physical expression. Thank you, sir. We are um, spirit living in a natural body. Why? To manifest what is in the spirit in the natural. That's what he gave us the body for not to decorate it, not paint it, not put all the stuff on it. The purpose of this body was to make the spiritual natural. 
what is in the spirit, what is in the invisible, make it visible. That's the purpose of this body. And mind is the connecting point between the spirit and the body. So may the Lord help us. So any questions or comments for Dr. Sean before we close today? Any questions, any comments that you have from what you heard today? Anybody? Freddie, do I see your hand now or it was there before? Yeah, it's there, Apostle. I'm lifting my hands. You're lifting your hands always. Yes. I want just to say thank you to uh, Dr. Jean for that powerful message. I was, uh, as you was uh, sharing, I began to ask myself questions like, uh, what have you been doing all this while? Wayne was explaining on the ecclesia. And I believe that uh, uh, Doc, that was so powerful. How I just feel that uh, it is time now when we should start implementing and believing you know, the way you taught us today to say we are ambassadors, church is not a place where you sing songs, 10 songs and go home. Church is not a place where you just, you know, dance around the corners of the church. But church really, it's a cabinet. Church, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a pillar that are called out to do an assignment for their king and their kingdom. So I want to say thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, may God bless you. And I really love the point where you said, I'm not a Christian. That point, it's a blow to so many people, but I believe it was so powerful that uh, you really explained really what uh, an ambassador is and what a Christian is in that statement. Thank you so much, Doc. God bless you. Thank you, Apostle Bramno. Thank you, Fred. Jefferson. Yeah. Good evening, Pastor Abraham and um, Reverend Jane. Um, Sean, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce the name. I want to thank God for this opportunity, for this message. It was so powerful and it was so enlightening that he has given us a full understanding of how the kingdom is supposed to be. Um, my question here is, um, like in a situation, sorry, sir, when you made reference to the kidnapping issue, you know, in Nigeria today, there's the northern part of Nigeria, we're experiencing high rates of kidnapping. And there are times that I will sit down on my own and decree and say, let the angels of God go to those places they are and scatter their plans and their devices. So um, based on your testimony, the little I got, I saw that you took an action on calling the authorities into this um, into, um, into the situation. So in like this situation we are today, is it okay for me to decree and say, okay, in the name of Jesus, all their plans and their devices shall come to an end in the name of Jesus. And maybe I might not know what to do or should I wait for the Holy Spirit to direct me on what to do so as to combat these kind of issues. And um, secondly, um, I don't know whether it's okay because you know, sometimes when you, you're involved in the things in like in your country, like in Nigeria, there's a place always when you're feeling a, any form, they I'll tend to ask you whether you're a Muslim or a Christian. So sometimes I just decided that I will not even answer any of those questions. I will just put others because um, I have not identified as a Christian. However, I'm identified as a son of God. So I don't know that um, that is okay. Thank you very much, sir. Dr. John, do you want to go? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I believe I will give you I think I'll give you my preferable answer <laughs> would be um, one other thing I believe that we can do as a, we need to be strategic in our thinking and the way we go about this. For example, I went to the, I went to the police. I went to the police um, and, and they told me to tell, they told me to tell the kidnappers we had the money so that they could uh, do their thing. While I was talking to the police chief, the kidnappers called me. And I told them that, look, people like me have money three ways. Either we borrow it, we work for it, or it's given to us. Neither of three of those three happened, so I have no money. That's why I tell them. So I said, I don't want to talk to you until I hear my sons. At some point in time, I will, you know, 
the police now sent two people to my house to investigate because they couldn't understand how I was acting. My wife was with me, we're not crying. My point in this is that we are, we were in a position where I was influencing the chief of police. But, but beside that, what I'm saying is that at our, at our church, we were very much involved in pushing kingdom people into offices. They need to be, we, we will have a less of our issues if we were pushing people, you know, supporting Christian into office so that they, when they're in that position, actually they'll be able to hear, they'll be able to, you can actually, you can have their ears, you can help and direct them. Had it not been, I had some kind of influence over the police chief, he would not work with me or cooperate with me in those areas. I would have not earned his respect in that regard. So I think there was some level that we need to be able to, you know, influence those people. But there is still a place for us to stand and decree what we want over the nation. Like I said again, every physical reality has a spiritual dimension and every spiritual reality has a physical expression. We do actually war in the spirit. There are times where we need to do more than just pray and declare. There are time, there's a time for that. I'm not gonna get into that now, but the Bible says, seek the well-being of the nation where you are. Seek the well-being of the nation where you are and pray the Lord in its favor. What does that mean? It's two different things. Seek its well-being, then and pray. That means that mean pray must be different than something that else that we need to do in order to secure our properties, our lands, our environments, and our cities. So I pray that the Lord will give you wisdom as to what exactly in your particular situation that you would need to do as a way of interacting or strategizing and whatever, you know, with, with the authorities in that area. But there is a place in our, you know, endeavor to not only pray, which is necessary while we pray, we need to be sometime doing some other activities as well when that varies based on where you are. Amen. May I say something, uh, Apostle Abraham? Yes, Mama. Yes. Well, I am, I must say, use the word fascinated. I am totally emboldened. I am totally blown away by the camaraderie of Apostle Abraham John and Dr. Jean Petitfrayer. They are two brothers. I've seen them work together. And all I want to say now is that God has blended your hearts together as brothers so that one can enrich the other and together have the impact that today's ministry by Dr. Jean has um, made and the, and the lessons that we have learned today. We know your message, Apostle, and here we are listening to what your brother, your Haitian brother by another mother Same has mother. brought oh, <laughs> into, <laughs> into the kingdom for such a time as this. The second thing I want to say, because the child that Dr. Jai is talking about is, is my grandchild, with the same ownership that made a difference. This is my son. And that is what empowered Dr. Jean to become a kingdom ambassador. The spirit, the ownership. And I will simply say, I have been an educator and I have to think of the education of the nations as if it is my child. This is my portfolio and I am going to demand make declarations and decrees and shape the culture of the nations through education. I'm saying that because listening to you, Apostle John, are people like Fred Masumba and others whom God has called. So I want you, all of you, to ask what, is, what are you the father of? How, what do you say, this is my son? This realm of influence is mine and I am going to make it a kingdom portfolio for me and 
etc. So God bless you. Thank you for that, for the teachings today. And I just love to see one Indian man and one Haitian brother just working together. God bless you. So Mama, tell I, sh I shouldn't say a Haitian man. I'm sorry. It's a Haitian prince <laughs> and an Indian prince. Tell us what's happening next Saturday, please. Well, well, next Saturday, um, the twelfth of the twelfth of March, I have been empowered today um, by the message brought by um, Dr. Jean for many reasons. Um, because we already have decided to just um, comfort the hearts of the listeners today. These two men of God have decided that Haiti will be changed. Haiti will be changed. I think we said, I, I, not I think, I know we said in 10 years, we are going to work on a, port, uh, uh, a, a piece of work that will make, will shape the culture because Haiti is my son. All right. So this, um, we're going, one of the ways we're going to do it is through education. We are going to shape um, the culture of, of Haiti through education. We are going to shape the thinking we're going to use teacher educators ambassadors there we're going to use parents we're going to use people who are leaders to utilize um to know the fact that if you want to shape a child you have to educate a child if you want to shape a, a, a nation to become a kingdom country you have to educate that country so we're having this conference on um march the 12th when we are going to make those kinds of statements and when we are going to end up having a global organization of educators and ambassadors and leaders of nations. And uh, through your um, ministry past, uh, apostle, um, people can uh, get information on how to um, register and then get the link for next March the 12th, Saturday from 10 to one Eastern Standard Time. Register and you will get the link and you will get the, the, the information from the various um, places we use, but also directly from Apostle John. Yeah, I believe everybody received an email with the graphics about the Congress happening Saturday. So please go to the website mentioned on it, register, then you will receive the Zoom meeting link. and link. Thank you, Mama, for sharing that. Um, I see one more hand, Brother Dominic. Please unmute then. Oh, yes. Um, good evening. Good morning. Um, I'm very encouraged by the message, but it's not just a mere message. Um, from my personal experience, from what the doc has taught, um, there are very few people who can be able to kind of uh, get this message and bring it into reality. The reason very simple is that uh, uh, church has been tuned to emotional rather than to a place where there is a strategic planning and a strategic understanding of what God is saying and what God is doing at this time. So uh, my encouragement to all of us is that uh, this thing will cost, cost us a lot. It will cost us a lot of things because it seems to be something which is new and many people are still locked up into something which is not workable. That's why we are in this state. The problem we have now is that uh, the church in the way it's being taken is something which is toothless something which is not powerful, something which cannot construct anything, something which cannot even form a simple industry to do something for the benefit of the lives of people. So um, it's something which is a very complex issue and it requires us to have the mind of Christ. That's why uh, Jesus himself, he said, when you see me, you have seen the Father. Now, the people who don't understand, they will think Jesus was trying to be contradictory. But it's a simple thing which the doc said that uh, it's uh, let the kingdom come, have dominion, control things, put things in good order. So um, we need to be ready to pay the price. 
Thank you so yes, much. Yes, um, brother uh, Abraham, may I yeah. say something? Um, yes. um, it's important that I do this. I, um, Apostle Dr. Jean referred to Genesis 1, 28, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, have dominion, the earth is yours, shape the earth. So today I take the opportunity as a mother, as I bless my own three sons and these two here, I bless Dominic. You have been given that name. You know what a powerful name you have? Because you are born to have dominion. Fred and the other persons who have, I know many of the names. I'm speaking to you now. I'm saying, be blessed. I release the dominion blessing upon your life. So you will walk from this day on, head and shoulders above the rest, head and shoulders above the weaknesses. You will not be humbugged by the weaknesses that we have seen in the church. That is on another, uh, that's not yours to even forget that. Know who you are in your nation. Feel, Dominic, feel the force of the power of God inside of you as you walk your streets and as you look at your cities and your towns and you say God has made me to have dominion over this area so we are blessing each other today with that spirit which gives you the push forward it is not as difficult as you think receive the blessing I'm using the modus operandi that God used in Genesis 1 28 and God bless them and God said unto them, have dominion. Let may dominion be released in your life so that you would be able to fulfill the requirements of the mandate for earth colonization. God bless you. Amen. As we want to give, we want to bless Dr. Jean. You know, we want to partake the grace God has bestowed upon him. So I would encourage you, all of you, my Ecclesia family to sow into his life, sow into his ministry. Um, if you are led by the Holy Spirit to sow a financial seed into his ministry, because anyone who comes to speak in the Ecclesia, we will give an opportunity to sow into their life. It doesn't matter who it is, from where they are from, we want to bless them for sowing into our life, imparting to us. So please go to our website, choose choose guest speaker and give the best donation that you can, the seed that you can. And I will send it to Dr. Jean, um, whatever comes in. So I appreciate that. And Heather, will you please announce the names of the people who will be sharing next week? If you are here, you can hear me. Uh, please share the names of the people that will be speaking, sharing, manifesting the kingdom next week with the Ecclesia. And I, did I see Ken and Lori's hand? Lori, did I see your hand or did you put your hand down? Yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, thank um, Pastor Jean. First of all, for the history lesson, that was fascinating and it really um, helped to understand, you know, the nation's situation so much better, even though I probably should have learned that in school, but. I didn't. And just the way he enhanced our teachings with you um, was powerful. Uh, because he gave us the history, then he gave us a strategy, and he gave us the declarations, and it was all systematically done uh, according to the spirit. And I just want to thank him for that. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Always raging, exhorting. That's your gift. Did you realize, Lori? Uh, Heather, please announce it. Uh, so next week, who's going to be sharing is Miriam and Anita and Never Neverlin, Otis, and Patrick. I apologize if I didn't say your name correctly. Oh, okay. Thank you, Heather. So please be ready. We have a powerful team next week. Miriam, Anita, all the way from Philippines. Nervalin, Otis, Patrick. I don't know if Patrick is going to be here or not, but maybe we had to add one more name uh, of somebody that we missed previously, Heather, if you have somebody left. Any other questions or comments for Dr. Sean or anything before we close today? 
Thank you, Dr. Sean. Thank you for blessing us. We are so blessed. The purpose and power of kingdom colonization. You know, his son who was kidnapped, but God delivered. How old is he now? What is he doing now? He's a mighty man. He is, uh, he's 26 now. <laughs> 26 now. What is he doing? He's, uh, he's in the Navy, U.S. Navy. The U.S. Navy. Wow. <laughs> Amazing testimony of God's redemption. You know, like he said, we need both spiritual and the natural. Prayer is powerful. But if you don't make room in the natural for the manifestation of that prayer, we are not believing our prayer. We have to make room in the natural. You know, like Mary said, let it be to me according to thy word. So we have to make room for those prayers to manifest. Jesus said, fill those water jars with water. What if they just prayed blah, 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 blah for three hours? and never fill that water jars with water, no miracle happens. Sometimes you know, we fire like a machine gun for three hours. We don't do the things in the natural when we shoot and we don't see the change. We don't see the manifestation. That's what the Pentecostal and the charismatics missed. They went after the spirit, which is powerful, which is important, but the natural is equally important. Everybody say equally important. The natural, important. natural things are equally important as in the spirit. You cannot miss one and focus on the other. We won't see the result. We won't see the change. We won't see the transformation. We need both. Like a train need two tracks. God's kingdom to manifest. We need spiritual and the natural to manifest. One is not more than important than the other or more important than the other, both are equally important. That's why the Bible says, in the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. Heaven is spiritual, earth is natural. Both are created by God, both are important. So God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Have a wonderful, glorious week. Father, we thank you for that word that penetrated our hearts, implanted into our spirit man to the good soil. May that seed bring forth 30, 60, and 100-fold return, Father, for thy kingdom's sake, so that Jesus Christ have nations as his inheritance, cities as his throne, Father. We thank you for that word to become flesh. See, the word which was spiritual became flesh, natural. We thank you, the promises that you have spoken over us. Let them become flesh. Let them become natural. Let them manifest in our life, in the natural, Father, from the spiritual into the natural, spiritual, natural expression. Thank you for the word that you shared with us today. Bless Dr. Jean, his family, his ministry, his church in Haiti. Protect them, Father. Thank you for increase, multiplication, and fill that country, restore it back to your kingdom blueprint. We call Haiti belongs to Jesus Christ as his inheritance. We thank you for raising up your army in that country and all the Caribbean islands belongs to Jesus Christ, his inheritance, Father. I bless my Ecclesia family as they go forth this week to have a glorious, wonderful, fruitful, peaceful, anointed breakthrough week, Father. We give you all the glory and praise in Jesus Christ's holy name. We pray. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. Amen. Bless you. Amen. 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 And in Amen. Amen. We will see you next week. God bless you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes.